Introduction to 1 John. The author of the epistle was John, son of Zebedee, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the youngest of the apostles and survived them all. He does not indeed put his name to the epistle, as the apostle Paul, Peter, James, and Jude do to theirs. And it is easy to observe that when this disciple in his writings had any occasion to speak of himself, it was usually by a circumlocation, as the disciple whom Jesus loved, or the other disciple, studiously concealing his name, so that his not putting his name to his epistle need not create any scruple about his being the author of it, which everywhere breathes the temper and spirit of this great apostle. And whoever compares this epistle and the gospel written by him together will easily conclude it to be his, both from the style and the subject matter of it. And besides, as Ichabus uh, asserts, this epistle was generally received without scruple, both by ancient and modern writers. It is called general because it is not written and sent to any particular church or person, and that because it was for the general use of the churches, for so are the particular epistles, but because it was written to the Christians in general, or to the believing Jews in general, wherever they were. For this it was written to the Jews seems evident from 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. It was called by some of the ancients the epistle of John to the Parthians, by whom must be meant not the natives are Parthia, but the Jews professing to believe in Christ, who dealt in that empire. We read of the Parthians, Jews, a feast of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 9, who at that time might be converted and upon their return to their own country, lay the foundation of a gospel church state there. Dr. Lightfoot conjectures from a passage in 3 John 1, 9 that this epistle was written to the Corinthians, but there does not seem to be any sufficient reason for it. As for the time when and place where the epistle was written, it is not easy to say. Some think it was written at Patmos, where the apostle was banished in the reign of Domitian, and where he wrote the book of the Revelations, see Revelations chapter 1, verse 9. And here some say he wrote his gospel in this epistle, and that a little before the destruction of Jerusalem, which he calls the last time or hour, and that his design in writing it was to exhort the believing Jews, either in Parthia or scattered about in other countries, to belovedly love and to warn them against false Christ and false prophets, which were now gone forth into the world to deceive men. See 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Others think that it was written by him when a very old man, after his return from his exile in um, Ephesus, where he resides during his life and where he died and was buried. It was called his first epistle generally. Not that it was his first general epistle, for the other two are written to particular persons, but it is the first he wrote and which is general. The occasion and manifest design of it is to promote brotherly love, which he enforces upon the best principles and with the strongest arguments taken from the love of God and of Christ, from the commandments of Christ, and its being in evidence of regeneration and the truth and glory of a profession of religion, and also to oppose and stop the growth of lascivious principles and practices and he doctrines of the civic principles and practices he condemns are these that believers had no sin in them or need not be concerned about it nor about their outward conversation so be they had but knowledge and these men boasted of their communion with God notwithstanding their impieties and which were the sentiments and practices of the Nicolaitans and Gaussianites and the Christians the heresies he sets himself against and refutes are such as regard the doctrine of the Trinity and the person in the office of Christ. There are some who deny a distinction of persons in the Trinity and assert there was but one person, 
that the Father was not distinct from the Son, nor the Son from the Father, and by confounding both, tacitly deny there was either as Simon Magnus and his followers regard is to add to these in First John chapter 2, verse 22, and others as the unbelieving Jews denied that Jesus was the Messiah or that Christ was come in the flesh. These are taken notice of in First John chapter 2, verse 22. Others that professed to believe in Jesus Christ denied his proper deity and asserted he was a mere man and did not exist before he took flesh. Other virgin, as Eman and spelled C E R I N T H U S, these are opposed in First John chapter one verse one, and others deny his real humanity and affirmed that he was a mere phantom, that he only had the appearance of a man, and assumed human nature, and suffered and died and rose again, in show only and not in reality. Of which sort of the followers of Saturus and Basilius, and which are confuted in First John chapter one verse one. This epistle is by Clemens Alexandrius called his greater or larger epistle, it being so in comparison to the other two that follows. First John chapter one verse one John Gill, the exposition of the entire Bible verse by verse, being read by Dr. Peter John. First John chapter one verse one that which was from the beginning, by which is meant not the gospel, as if the apostle's design was to assert the antiquity of that and clear it from the charge of novelty. For though that is called the word in the word of life and is the spirit which gives life, and it means the quickening dead sinners and brings the report of eternal life and salvation by Christ, Yet the seeing of it with bodily eyes and handling it with corporal hands do not agree with that. But Jesus Christ is here intended, who is his divine nature, was, really existed as a divine person, as the everlasting Jehovah, the eternal I am, which is and was and is to come and existed from the beginning. Not from the beginning of the preaching of the gospel by John only, for he was before the gospel was preached, being the first preacher of it himself, and before John was. Yea, before the prophets, before Abraham, and before Adam, and before all creatures, from the beginning of time, and of the creation of the world, being the maker of all things, even from everlasting, for otherwise he could not have been set up in an office capacity. So earthly or godly elect, he chosen in him, for the foundation of the world, and they have grace and blessings given them in him before the world began, and, or an everlasting covenant be made with him, see First John chapter 1, verse 1, which we have heard. This, with what follows, proves him to be truly and really man. For when the word was made flesh, and dealt among men, the apostles heard, and saw, and handled him. They only heard a voice from heaven, declaring him to be the Son of God, but they often heard him speak himself, both in private conversation with them, and in his public ministry. They heard his many excellent discourses on the mount, and elsewhere, and those that were particularly dear to them, a little at before his death, and blessed were they on this account. Matthew thirteen sixteen, which we have seen with our eyes, with the eyes of the body, with their own and not another. And they saw him in human nature, in common actions of life he did, as eating, drinking, walking, etc. And his many miracles, they saw him raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, store the sight of the blind, cause the lame to walk, the dumb to speak, the deaf to hear, and saw him transfigured on the mount. John was one that was present at that time and saw his glory, as he also was when he hung upon the cross and saw him bleeding, gasping, and dying there. They saw him after the resurrection from the dead. He showed himself to them alive and was seen of them forty days. They saw him go up to heaven and a cloud receiving him out of their sight, which we have looked upon wistfully and intently, once and again and a thousand times and with the utmost pleasure and delight and knew him perfectly well and were able to describe exactly his person, statue, features, 
and the ligaments of his body. And our hands have handled of the word of life, as Peter did when Jesus caught him by the hand on the water when he was ready to sink, and as this disciple did when he leaned on his bosom, and as Thomas did even after the resurrection when he thrust his hand into his side, and as all the apostles were called upon to see and handle him, that it was he himself and not his spirit, which was not flesh and bones as he had. Now, as this is said of Christ, the word of life, who is so called because he has life in himself as God, as the mediator, and as man, and is the author of life, natural, spiritual, and eternal, it must be understood as he, the word, is made manifest in the flesh, for he, as a word, or as a divine person, or as considered in his divine nature, is not to be seen nor handled. This, therefore, is spoken of the word, or of the person of Christ, God-man, with respect to his human nature, as united to the Logos, or the word of God. And so it is a proof of the truth and reality of his human nature by several of the senses. John Gill's Exposition of the Bible, 1 John chapter 1, verse 2. For the life was manifested, that is, the word of life, who is life itself, the foundation of life, having it as God in and of himself, without deriving from and independent of another, originally and eternally, and who is the cause, author, and giver of life in every sense to others. This living God, who from all eternity was invisible, was in the fullness of time manifested in human nature. See John chapter 1, verse 14. As we have seen, as before the eyes of their bodies, and bear witness, for they were both eye and ear witnesses of the word and of the truth of his incarnation, and bore a faithful record to his proper deity and real humanity, and show unto you the, that eternal life, Jesus Christ, the true God, and eternal life, as in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, so called because he has everlasting life in himself, as he is the living God, and because he has eternal life for all his people, not only the purpose and promise of it are in him, but the thing itself, and it is in his power and gift to pursue it on all the Father has given him, and to them he does give it. The beginning of it lies in the knowledge of him, and the consummation of it will be the lasting vision and enjoyment of him, which was with the Father, that is, which life, eternal life, and word of life, was from the beginning, or from all eternity, with God and the Father, which phrase is expressively of the eternal existence of Christ as the Word and Son of God with his Father, his relation to him, his oneness in nature, and equality with him and his personal distinction from him. See John chapter 1, verse 1. And was manifested unto us in human nature, as before observed, and that to the apostles, as he was not to the patriarchs and prophets. For though they see him in promise, in prophecy, in type and figure, he sometimes appear in a human form for a short time to them, yet they did not see him incarnate in actual union with human nature, nor had they him dwelling among them and conversing with them as the apostles had. This was and happy peculiar to them. John Gill's Exposition of the Bible, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. And that which we have seen and heard, this is repeated, both to confirm and illustrate what had been before said, and to carry on the discourse to what follows. Declare we unto you, you, in the ministry of the Word, the Person, and offices of Christ, being the sum and substance of the Gospel, ministration, that declares him to be the true God and eternal life, God of raw, blessed forever, and truly man, made of a woman and made under the law, and to be the only mediator between God and man, to be prophet, priest, and king, and to be alone, savior, and redeemer. This declares the greatness and excellency of his salvation, 
what an able, proper, and suitable Savior He is, and what precious promises and spiritual blessings are in Him, even all grace and eternal glory. And this declaration of Him is made in the Gospel for the following ends and purposes, that ye may that ye also may have fellowship with us in hearing, seeing, and handling of Christ in a spiritual sense and by enjoying the same privileges in God's house and family, the same ordinances and spiritual provisions, joining and partaking with them in all the immunities and advantages of a gospel church state here and by being with them in all eternity hereafter. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father, the Father of Christ, the covenant God and Father of his people, and which they have with him when under the influence and witnessings of the Spirit of adoption, and can in strength of faith call him their Father, draw nigh to him through Christ as such, and are indulged with his presence and discoveries of his love. And with his Son, Jesus Christ, being in union with union to him, they become partakers of him and of his blessings. They receive out of his fullness and grace for grace. They are admitted to an intimacy and familiarity with him. They are had into his chambers of secret retirement. They are brought into the banqueting house where his banner over them is love, and where he sups with them, and they with him. And into this fellowship they are called by the grace of God through the gospel, as also they have fellowship with the blessed Spirit, though not here mentioned. See 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. John Gill's Exposition of the Bible, 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. And these things write we unto you, concerning the deity and eternity of Christ, the word and concerning the truth of humanity and the manifestation of him in the flesh and concerning that eternal life and salvation which is declared in the gospel to be in him and concerning the saints fellowship one with another and with God the Father and with Jesus Christ that your joy may be full meaning either their spiritual joy in this life which has Christ for its object and is increased by the consideration of the proper deity his incarnation and mediation by a view of free justification by his righteousness and atonement, by his blood, by a sight of his glorious person, by faith and by intimate communion with him, and a discovery of his love which passes knowledge, and which joy, when it is large and very great, may in a comparative sense be said to be full, though not absolutely so, and being as much as can well be enjoyed in this state, nothing can more contribute to it and a declaration of the both things in the gospel, and an experimental acquaintance with them, and enjoyment of them, or else it may intend the joy of the saints in the world to come, in the presence of Christ, where are the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, and so may express the ultimate glory and happiness of God's people, which is the chief end, as of his purposes, promises, and covenant, so of the gospel and the declaration of it. The Syriac version renders it, that our joy, which is in you, may be full. It is the joy of the ministers of the word, when the saints are established in the faith of Christ's person and offices, and have communion with him, which, with which view they declare him and bear record of him. Some copies read, Our Joy. John Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, verse by verse. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This, then, is the message of God and of his Son, the Word, or from Christ by his Apostles. The Syriac version renders it, This is the Gospel, which is good news from a far country, a message sent from the King of Kings to sinful men, or that is the declaration, that is the thing declared or showed. Some render it, This is the promise, that whereas God is light, such who walk in the light shall have communion with him, and others shall not. Which we have heard of him, of Christ, who has declared him that he is light without any mixture of darkness, that is a pure spirit and must be worshipped in a spiritual way, and that only spiritual worshippers are such as he seeks and admits to commune with him.
proper they might hear and learn this of Christ by his telling them that he himself was light, who is the image of the invisible God, insomuch that he that has seen the Son has seen the Father also. Wherefore, if the one is light, the other must be likewise. Nor is there any coming to the Father and enjoying communion with him, but through Christ, all which our Lord told his disciples. The Ethiopic version reads, which ye have heard, very wrongly, for the words regard the apostles, who made a faithful declaration of the message they heard and had from Christ, which is as followed, and declare unto you that God is light, that is, God the Father, as distinguished from him, Christ, of whom they had heard this message, and from Jesus Christ, his Son, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. What is declared of him, agreeably, to the report of Christ, is that he is light, that is, as light is opposed to the darkness of sin, he is pure and holy in his nature and works, and of such pure eyes as not to behold iniquity, and so perfectly holy that angels cover their times before him when they speak of his holiness. And as light is opposite to the darkness of ignorance, he is wise in knowing. He knows himself, his own nature, being and perfections. His Son and Spirit and their distinct modes of subsisting. He sees clearly all things in himself, all things he could do or has determined shall be done. He has perfect knowledge of all creatures and things in darkness and the light are alike unto him, nor can the former hide from him. He is knowable and to be discerned. He is clothed with light and dwell in it. He may be known by the works of creation and providency even the invisible things of him. His eternal power and Godhead may be clearly seen and understood by them, and especially in his word, and most clearly in his Son. It is owing to the darkness of men, and not to any in and about God, who is light, that he is so little known as he is, and, like the light, he illuminates others. He is the Father of lights, the author and giver of all light, of the light of reason to men in general, and of grace here and glory hereafter to his own people, which are both signified by light, in whose light they see light, and he refreshes and delights their souls with the light of his countenance now and with his glorious presence in the other world. And in him is no darkness at all, no darkness of sin, nothing is more contrary to him or more distinct from him nor any darkness of error and ignorancy. What is unknown to men as the times and seasons, what angels were ignorant of, and even Christ, as man, as the day and hour of Jerusalem destruction, were known to the Father. In him is no ignorancy of anything whatever, nor is there any variableness or shadow of turning in him, as there is in the luminous body of the sun. But God is always the same pure and holy, wise and known being, it is usual that the like Jews to call the supreme being, RWA, light, the most simple light, hidden light, and infinite light, with respect to his nature, glory, and majesty, and with regard also to his grace and mercy, justice and judgment. Although as R. Sangar, this S A N G A R D T, says, This is to be understood of him figuratively. John Keel's exposition of the entire Bible. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, the Alexandrian copy reads, For if we say, that is, if any profess to be partakers of the divine nature, to be like unto God, and to have communion with him, to have the light of his countenance and the discoveries of his love, and walk in darkness, in the darkness of sin, ignorancy, and unbelief, or in a state of unregeneracy and blindness, 
whose understandings are darkened, and they know not God in Christ, nor have any true sight and sense of themselves. Their sin and danger, and are ignorant of Christ and his righteousness, and the way of salvation by him, and are strangers to the Spirit of God, and of the work of his grace, and are unacquainted with the truths of the gospel. And not only so, but go on in darkness more and more, prefer it to the light, love it and the works of it, have fellowship with them and choose them, take pleasure in the ways of sin and wickedness, and continue and walk on in them. If such persons pretend to fellowship with God, they are liars. We lie. It cannot be. It is a contradiction. The thing is impossible or impractical. What communion hath light with darkness? Or what fellowship can the throne of iniquity or those in whom sin reigns have with God? For God is light, and were they partakers of him, or like unto him, or at communion with him, they would consequently be in the light, and not in darkness, and much less walk in it. Wherefore, they are liars, and do not the truth. They do not say the truth, nor act according to it. They do not act un un uprightly or sincere, but are hypocrites, and pretend to that which they have not. And if they did the truth, they would come to the light and not walk in darkness. See John chapter 3, verse 21. John Gill's Exposition of the Entire Bible. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, are persons enlightened by the Spirit of God so as to have a true sight and sense of sin, to know Christ and the way of salvation by Him, and are children of the light and are going on and increasing in spiritual light and knowledge? Walk on in Christ, the light, by faith, and in the light and truth of the gospel, as becomes it, and as children of light, and as such we are called out of darkness into marvelous light. As he is in the light, according to the light which he has given, who is light itself, is in it, and dwells in it. This quote, as, unquote, denotes not equality, but likeness. When in this is the case, then it is a clear point that we have fellowship one with another, not with the saints, with the apostles, and other Christians, but with God. We have mutual communion, as the Arabic version renders it, God with us, and we with him. Some copies read, with him, as in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. And such a reading the sense requires, and agreeably to this, the docopic version renders it, and we are partakers among ourselves with him. That is, we are jointly and mutually appear to be like him and partaker of his nature and have communion with him, and not only so, but with his Son, Jesus Christ, as appears from our having a share in the cleansing efficiency of his blood. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. There is the pollution on human nature, which is original, natural, universal, and eternal, and is such that nothing can remove but the blood of Christ, not ceremonial absolutions and sacrifices, nor moral duties, nor evangelical performances, or submissions to the gospel ordinances, and particularly baptism, which is not the putting away of the faith of the flesh, nor even the graces of the Spirit. No, not faith. No, otherwise, then it, it, as it has to do with this blood. For this cleansing is not to be understood of sanctification, for that more properly belongs to the Spirit of God. And besides, does not cleanse from all sin. For notwithstanding this, sin is in the saints, but either of the atonement of sin, by the sacrifice of Christ, and so of a complete justification from it by his blood, which is put for both his active and passive obediency, the one being finished in the other, or rather of the pardon of sin, procured by the blood of Christ, and the application of that blood 
to the consciency, which purges it from dead works, and which has a continual virtue in it for the purpose. Christ's blood, being applied by the Spirit of God, has been always cleansing from sin. It had this virtue in it, and was of this use, even before it was actually shed. To the Old Testament saints, whence Christ is said to be the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And it has the same efficiency now as when first shed, and will have to the end of the world, and being sprinkled upon the conscience by the Spirit of God. It takes away the sins of believers and cleanses them from it. As far as the corruption of nature rises, or sin appears and removes them out of their sight, and speaks peace to their souls, and which is owing as to the dignity of Christ's person and the value of his sacrifice, so to his continual intercession, advocacy, and mediation, and which reaches to all sin, original and actual, secret and open sins, sins of the heart, thought, lip, and life, sins of omission and commission, greater or lesser sins, committed against light and knowledge, grace and mercy, law and gospel, all but the sin against the Holy Ghost. And in this Christ was the antitype of a scapegoat, of which the Jews say that it atoned for the transgression of the law, whether small or great, sins of presumption or of ignorancy, known or not known, which were against an affirmative or negative command, which deserved cutting off by the hand of God, or death by the Sanhedrin. The Arabic and Ethiopic versions render it from all our sins, and this must be ascribed to the greatness of his person as the Son of God. Wherefore, the emphasis lies on these words, his Son, the Son of God who is equal with God, and in truly and properly God, as it must be the blood of man that must, according to the law, be shed to atone for and expiate sin and cleanse from it, and that of an innocent man who is holy, harmless, and without sin. So it must not be the blood of a mere man, though ever so holy, but the blood of one that is God as well as man. See Acts chapter 20. Verse 28, the divine nature of the Son of God, being in union with the human nature, put virtue into his blood to produce such an effect, which still continues and will, as long as there is any occasion for it. On Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, verse by verse, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, Notwithstanding believers are cleansed from their sins by the blood of Christ, yet they are not without sin. No man is without sin. This is not only true of all men as they come into the world, being conceived in sin and shapen by iniquity, and uh, of all that are in the state of regen unregeneration, and of God's elect, while in such a state that even of all regenerated and sanctified persons in this life, as appears by the ingenuous confessions of sin made by the saints in all ages, by their complaints concerning it and groans under it, by the continual war in them between flesh and spirit, and by their prayers for the discoveries of pardoning grace and for the fresh application of Christ's blood for cleansing, by their remissionness, remissionness of their discharge or duty and by their frequent slips and falls and often backslidings and though their sins are all pardoned and they are justified from all things by the righteousness of Christ yet they are not without sin though they are freed from the guilt of sin and are under no obligation to punishment on account of it yet not from the beginning of it their sins were indeed transferred from them to Christ and he has bore them, and took them, and put them away, and they are redeemed from them, and are acquainted, acquitted, discharged, and pardoned, so that sin is not imputed to them. But God sees no iniquity in them in the article of justification. 
and also their iniquities are caused to pass from them as to the guilt of them, and are taken out of their sight, and they have no more conscience of them, having their hearts sprinkled and purged by the blood of Jesus, and are clear of all condemnation, the curse of the law, the wrath of God, or the second death by reason of them, yet pardon of sin and justification from it, though they take away the guilt of sin and free from obligation to punishment. Yet they do not take out the being of sin or cause it to cease to act or do not make sins cease to be sins or change the nature of actions of sinful ones to make them harmless, innocent, or indifferent. The sins of believers are equally sins with other persons, are of the same kind in nature, and equally transgressions of the law, and many of them are attended with more aggravating circumstances and are taken notice of by God and resented by Him, and for which He chastises His people in love. Now, though, a believer may say that he has not this or that particular sin, or is not guilty of this or that sin, for he has the seeds of all sin in him, yet he cannot say he has no sin, and though he may truly say he shall have no sin, for in the other state the being and the principle of sin will be removed, and the saints will be perfectly holy in themselves, yet he cannot in this present life say that he is without it, if any of us who profess to be cleansed from sin by the blood of Christ should affirm this, we deceive ourselves. Such persons must be ignorant of themselves and put a cheat upon themselves, thinking themselves to be something when they are nothing, flattering themselves what pure and holy creatures they are. When there is a fountain of sin and wickedness in them, these are self-deceptions, sad delusions, and gross impositions upon themselves. And the truth is not in us. It is a plain case. The truth of grace is not in such persons. For if there was a real work of God upon their souls, they would know and discern the plague of their own hearts, the impurity of their nature, and the imperfection of their obediency. Nor is the word of truth in them. For if they had an entrance into them and worked effectively in them, they would in the light of it, discover much sin and iniquity in them, and indeed there is no principle of truth, no veracity in them, there is no sincerity or ingenuity in them, they do not speak honestly and uprightly, but contrary to the dictates of their own conscience. Gill, the exposition of the entire Bible, verse by verse. First John chapter 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, and that not one for another. For though it is our duty to confess our faults to our fellow creatures and fellow Christians which are committed against them, yet are under no obligation to confess as are more immediately against God and which lie between him and ourselves, or at least it is sufficient to confess and acknowledge in general what sinful creatures we are without entering into particulars for confession of sin is to be made to God, against whom it is committed, and who only can pardon. And a man that truly confesses his sin is one that the Spirit of God has convinced of it, and has shown him his exceeding sinfulness, and filled him with a godly sorrow for it, and given him repentancy unto salvation, that needeth not to be repented of, and who under such a sight and sense of sin and concern for it comes and acknowledges it before the Lord, humbly imploring for Christ's sake his pardoning grace and mercy, and such obtain it. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Forgiveness of sin here intends not the act of faithfulness as in Christ, proceeding upon the bloodshed and sacrifice of Christ, which is done at once and includes all sin, past, present, and to come, but an application of pardoning grace to a poor, sensible sinner, humbled under a sense of sin, and confessing it before the Lord, 
and confession of sin is not the cause or condition of pardon, nor the manifestations of it, but is descriptive of the person and points him out to whom God will and does make known his forgiving love. For to whomsoever he grants repentancy, he gives the remission of sin, in doing of which he is faithful to his word of promise, such as in Proverbs 28, verse 13, and just in being true, as the Arabic version adds to his word and showing a proper regard to the blood and sacrifice of his son, for his blood being shed, and hereby satisfaction made to the law and the justice of God. It is a righteous thing in him to justify from sin and forgive the sinner for whom Christ has shed his blood, and not impute it to him or punish him for it. Though the word here used may answer to the Hebrew word Q-Y-D-U, which sometimes carries in it a notion and idea of mercy and benefits. Hence, mercy to the poor is sometimes expressed by righteousness in the righteous acts of God intend his mercies and benefits unto men. See Daniel 4.27 So forgiveness of sin springs from the tender mercies of our God and is both an act of justice and of mercy, of justice with respect to the blood of Christ and of pure grace and mercy to the pardoned sinner, the following clause, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness is but the same thing expressed in different words, for all unrighteousness is sin, and to cleanse us from sin is to remove the guilt of it by an application of the blood of Christ for pardon. The incident to the relative he in the text is either God, who is light, and with whom the saints have fellowship, or his Son, Jesus Christ, who is the nearest incident, and who, being true to God, has the power to forgive sin. Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, verse by verse. 1 John chapter 1, verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, have never sinned in time past as well as now, deny original sin, and that men are born in sin, but affirm they come into the world pure and holy, and assert that concupiency is not sin, and so not regarding internal lust and desires is sinful, but only what is external fancy they have so lived as to have been without sin. But if any of us give out such an assertion, we make him a liar, that is, God, who in his word declares that the wicked are estranged from the womb and go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies that his own people are transgressors from the womb, that all have sinned and come short of his glory, and that there is none that does good, no, not one, but all are under sin and the power and guilt of it, and become filthy by it, and so obnoxious to the wrath of God. And his word is not in us. Either Christ, the word of God, or rather the word of God that declares these things, no regard is had unto it. It is not with us, as the Syriac and Ethiopic versions render it. It is not used and attended to as the rule and standard of truth, but is east away and despised. At least it has no place in the hearts of such, nor does it work efficiently. For was this the case, they would have other notions of themselves than that of sinful creatures. The apostle has regard either to the Gnostic, a set of heretics of this age, who fancy themselves pure, spiritual and perfect, even in the midst of all their impurities, and notwithstanding their vicious lives, or to judicate, judicating Christians, and it may be to the Jews themselves, who entertain such sort of notions as these as being perfect and without sin. End of 1 John chapter 1.